death and assassinations are uh, the result of conspiracies. And it is the fact that Mossadegh was taken out by a conspiracy and so forth. So we, we, we shouldn't deny <coughs> that they sometimes actually happen. The question is, why are conspiracies effective? Why do they work? And that's because there's some underlying weakness that can be exploited over there. But now coming to your very important question of why is it that, that science flourished in Islam? And equally important, why did it die out? I think science is uh, something that comes by natural instinct to rational human beings. You look around and you see that, that apple over there drop and if you're smart, you figure out the law of gravity. And if you're um, smart, you'll see that planets also obey the law of gravity and the same laws here as there and so forth. So it's a, it's a natural drive within humans to want to know about the universe, to be able to explain it in simple terms. And this is the drive that Muslims, like everybody else, uh, had within them. This is something that, this was a drive that liberal caliphs of those times, people like Harun al-Rashid or uh, al mamun or others, they, they, they valued, nurtured, and because of the spirit of liberalism and tolerance in those times, you had Jews and Christians and uh, Muslims and uh, Sabians and everyone coming together. And it was a very cosmopolitan kind of atmosphere that you had in the course of those enlightened camps. Now, this enabled the scientific enterprise, the intellectual enterprise within Islam to, to grow. But this was also when this uh, theological division started appearing between those who believed in free destiny and those who believed in free will. The battle over Jabr and other of uh, free will and free destiny. This became really the basis for the uh, Mothazila and the Asharais splitting off. And then, uh, but it didn't happen suddenly, it happened over a period of uh, four centuries or so. Sometimes one, sometimes the other is dominant and so forth. But uh, eventually, it was the orthodoxy that, that, uh, that triumphed. And when it triumphed, well then, the possibilities of, of of uh, further intellectual progress and start to go down. You're absolutely right that if you were to ask this question of uh, a Maulana in Pakistan or anywhere in the Muslim world, he'll say, oh, it's because we strayed from the true path. It's because we didn't pray enough, we didn't keep all the fasts, we didn't go for Hajj, uh, or this, that, and that. We got away from the sirat mustaqim the true path. But this in complete denial of history because the, the caliphs where the greatest scientific progress took place were also the, by their way, in their way of thinking, were the most debauched. Where they were singing and dancing and whining and dining in the courts. So, that's the explanation you'll get from there. And then, again, you're, you're right that uh, people will explain the decline of Islam, of science in Islam, by saying that, uh, oh, the Mongols, in 1258, they sacked Baghdad, and everything's gone after that. It, it, it was like a nuclear war, they'll say. All right, if it was a nuclear war there, but what about Spain? What about big parts of the Maghreb? There's something that's lacking in their understanding of history. After all, you, you can't have, uh, you, you, you can't <coughs> have 700, 700 years of near to zero progress because of some incident that happened then. Hiroshima was bombed in 1945. Today it's a bustling city that's 10 times bigger than what it used to be. And yet, Muslims have not recovered from 1258. That's very difficult to understand. But thank you very much.
Yes, sir. Sir, the madrasa system of Pakistan is in a complete mess. But the children's study over there has, is very limited. They only have access to the Quran and the Hadith. And the Quran does not prevent Muslims from having access to greater knowledge of, of, of the world, including science and social science. And when those children grow up, they are taught to do jihad against both innocent people in the West and the Muslim world. So I'm basically not against the Madrasa system. I just wanted to ask, how can we revolutionize it so that even this, is, this system can produce world class citizens? It's a really good question. I'm afraid I don't have a very good answer. Uh, the madrasas, even on the subcontinent, are, are quite different in different places. What you said is very correct for madrasas in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, where they are taught this hardline Islam of uh, jihad and patal. But if you were to look at uh, Bangladesh, for example, madrasas they are much softer. <laughs> there, there um, uh, is in, in, in some madrasas in Bengal, you will. You even see Hindu students which are enrolled, and so uh, and uh, much the same can be said about uh, madrasas in in Africa. <coughs> to my mind, it's it's a very major issue that if you have students who go through the madrasa system, whether you get military training over there or not, some do definitely train students for fighting, for throwing bombs. Nevertheless, even the ones who do not, they create a mindset which is based upon obedience, upon acceptance, upon taking the, the word of the teacher to be the, the, the last word. That's, good. That's totally antithetical to the concept of modern knowledge. In fact, it's the concept of knowledge that one one has to understand that the ancient and the modern concepts of knowledge are totally different. Ancient knowledge was revealed from above. You had an authoritarian teacher who, who, whose job was to get it into that person's head. So modern knowledge is, is being created all the time. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a problem solving tool. And that's why a madrasa can, can, can never substitute for modern knowledge. Uh, I want to ask, maybe it's a more political type of question, but related to religion as well. Um, why superpowers, they suppress those liberal times or liberal uh, leaders in some countries, like Zulfikar Ali Bhutto could have been taken out of the country when before assassination, like uh, uh, Nawaz Sharif was taken out. So what are the interests and what are the reasons behind um, letting some countries go into this orthodoxy or pushing them into orthodoxy and not flourishing and not uh, leaving them to, uh, to be more liberal. The Shikarani Bhutto's time was relatively better off in that sense and complete contrast afterwards in General Ziyadhan's time. So superpowers, why they do that? I don't think the United States or Britain looked at the world through that prism until recently. Earlier on it was uh, who would give you the better access to your natural resources. If it's Saudi Arabia with a fundamentalist Wahhabi government there and they let you take the oil for for cheap. Well, it's fine. They, it's much preferable to having a liberal uh, socialist leader in Iran who, who will not allow you easy access to the oil. So it was about resources primarily. Now that there is this uh, conflict following 9-11 particularly, I think the, the, the West has started to look at things differently. 
they uh, of course cannot undo what they did before, but they, for example, are finding out what the costs were for for uh, creating the Mujahideen in, in Afghanistan. <coughs> That's in hindsight. Even our 